Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Harvest. I don't know if you could tell or not, but it's a little windy out there. <laughs> it's a dad joke. Still not, not very funny. Maybe some got it. But anyway, I am once again encouraged to just see those that are like, man, just look out the window. Man, it looks gnarly. But then you're like, I got to get to church today. I got to worship. You know, our Savior, he's done so much. I mean, I could go on all morning just listing all of the blessings that he's done for me and my family, but I will not bore with you guys with that. So <laughs> would you please stand and we will begin our worship set. The stars and you call them by name. The skies proclaim, God, you reign. Your glory shines. You teach the sun when to bring a new day. Creation sings, God, you reign.
morning, Titus. <laughs> you are instead of Uncle. Good morning, Titus. Happy belated birthday. Yeah. Oh, that's right. <clears throat> Remember this. Am I on now? Okay, great. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. Good. It looks like a light crowd, but it's kind of windy, so maybe everybody's decided to stay home. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so announcements for this week would be um, regular His Kids on Wednesday night, 6 to 7.30. Um, the youth group will be meeting at 401 Center for Catechism class, and you can see Perry if you need any more answers, which I don't see him either. <laughs> um, okay. Also, the 21st of April, which is a Sunday, we have our quarterly business meeting. Um, we are providing the potato bar and all the fixings, and we just ask you to bring a side dish and dessert. And the last item is um, VBS is now full ongoing, and, and so there's a, um, a board out front there, and it kind of tells you what's going on, but then sign-up sheets are also available, and they'll be in the newsletter with a QR code as well. And I think that's it. Since I forgot my mic, we'll use this one for the moment. <laughs> Would you uh, pray with me as we prepare our hearts for continuing to worship? Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for being able to gather on this Sunday morning. Uh, though the wind is fierce and blowing greatly, Lord, uh, we thank you for this facility where we can be out of it. And uh, Lord, I just pray that uh, our minds would not be so much outside this building, wondering what kind of dust is blowing around or what's happening in the world. But Lord, may we just uh, bring our thoughts back here and uh, focus on you for Lord, uh, you're the one uh, who's in control of all things and you need to be honored. And so that is our desire and our pursuit this morning is to honor you. And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. I'll be reading from Psalm 136, and uh, Psalm 136 has a response for the congregation, and uh, your response, as I read each of these verses, your response following that verse is this, his love endures forever. So I'll read each verse, and of course I'll pause, and that'll be, well, I'll, I'll help lead you in that his love endures forever. Okay, so it's a responsive reading. Psalm 136, the psalmist says, give thanks to the Lord. For he is good. His, His love, love endures forever. forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His, His love, love endures, endures forever. forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him alone does great wonders. His love, love endures, endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens. His, His love, love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. His love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his, his love, love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. And the moon and stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. Forever. Thank you. Amen. <clears throat> All right, as we get back to our worship set, I just ask again, like you've been preparing your hearts and how amazing it is to we can openly and just freely um, worship him so I think that's very very important um, to take advantage of that this is your time to just praise him and be grateful for what he's doing in your lives just your specific walk so would you please stand and we will continue with our worship set you thanks to the Lord our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arms, His love endures forever. Born. His love endures forever. 
Every fear is gone. I'm in your open arms. Where 
If you would, please join me as we dedicate the offering. And uh, I just heard there was a pretty bad pileup on the interstate, and I just feel called to pray for those guys real quick and the emergency responders uh, while it's happening. So if you would, please, uh, please pray with me. First of all, Father, we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for sending Christ to save us and redeem us. And we thank you so much for all that we were able to celebrate uh, this Easter season, uh, once again, a great reminder of your sacrifice and uh, of your love for us. Father, we thank you for your provision that you've given to us. We thank you for this offering. We pray that we would use it uh, wisely as you would uh, have us to do so in a way that pleases you and furthers your kingdom. And uh, Father, we uh, know there's an accident right now in the interstate, that there are emergency responders and people are hurting and, and in pain. Uh, Father, we pray for safety. We pray that uh, your will would be done. And uh, once again, Father, we pray that uh, our hearts would be turned to you and that we would focus on you and uh, what you would have us to learn from your word and what you would tell us this morning. So, Father, we just thank you and we praise you. And in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, once again, I would just ask that you would prepare your hearts today as communion, and we have a song kind of leading up to help prepare if you know the words um, please feel free to sing along with us wonderful mercy 
faithful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You get the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Counselor, Comforter, Keeper. Spirit we long to embrace. You are for hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. Well, at this time, we have the privilege of once again remembering what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And of course, we as a body of believers get to participate in the communion. And as we prepare for that, I want to invite the elders, if you would please come forward at this time as we serve the elements. Um, as the elements are passed, we just ask, first of all, as the bread comes your way, if you would just hold the bread and, uh, and then we will all participate and eat that bread together. So hold on to the bread, and same way when the cup comes to you, just hold the cup, and then I'll cue you, and we'll all participate together, okay? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we now want to prepare our hearts once again just to be reminded as well as remember what you did for each one of us on the cross. Lord, once again, we are reminded that our sinfulness was not a laughing matter at all, especially in your eyes. Therefore, you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay for those sins. And so we're reminded of that, Father. But as we celebrated last week, celebrated Easter morning, not only did you die on the cross and were buried, Lord, you came back to life. 
And so you now live and you reign at the right hand of your heavenly Father. And since you too live, Lord, the promise is we too, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, will will live forever and ever. And so we thank you for that promise. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. On that night, on that last night before Jesus was betrayed and uh, taken into custody by the Roman authorities and then eventually placed on that cross, but before all that took place, Jesus was in that upper room with his disciples and they all partook of communion. And Jesus' instruction to his disciples that time was to take some bread. And as they took the bread, he explained that that bread was a symbol that symbolized his body that would eventually be nailed to the cross. And so we, as followers of Christ, on this Sunday morning, we remember as well what Jesus did by placing his body on the cross. So I invite you to partake at this time.
in the cup. And uh, it's interesting with the Jewish practice, uh, they have a number of elements. And what we learned here just last Good Friday is that uh, there were four cups involved at that last meal, four cups. And uh, the one cup that I do remember, which we remember together, was the third cup, which was called the cup of redemption. And so when Jesus was serving and ministering to his disciples, at the time that he wanted them to reflect and think about his shed blood, he took, in Jewish custom, the third cup. And the third cup represents redemption. And so in our hands this morning, as we remember, we have the third cup, the cup of redemption, signifying the purchase of our salvation through the shedding of Christ's blood. So let's partake and remember together. Our Heavenly Father, we once again are a grateful people. We're grateful because in spite of uh, our humanness, meaning we many times can't get it right, we, we fall short, we do, we do sin, we're not, not proud of our behavior at times, Lord, we know ourselves, but we take delight in knowing that regardless of who we are, you never turn away from us. You always extend your grace and your mercy toward us. And so we remember that at this time, your grace and mercy that was expressed to us as sinners on that cross. Thank you, and I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Well, at this time, we'll dismiss the young people for a children's church. So, young people, you are free to head to children's church. Well, this morning, we are back in our series on the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, it has been four months, okay? It's been four months since we were studying Matthew. And uh, today we're in Matthew chapter 25. That's where we're at as we pick up our series. Uh, we're in Matthew 25. However, before we jump into Matthew 25, since it's been four months, I feel that it would be to our advantage if we review chapter 24 before pressing into Matthew 25. Now, chapters 24 and 25 of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 24 and 20, these are referred to as the Olivet Discourse, the Olivet Discourse. Uh, it's called the Olivet Discourse because Jesus shared these very words that we're going to be reading. He shared those in a message with his disciples on the Mount of Olives. So on the Mount of Olives, Jesus took time to communicate to his disciples and that particular message that he shared, which is Matthew 24 and 25, it's referred to as the Olivet Discourse. And the theme of Jesus' message at that time, on the Mount of Olives as he spoke, his theme was regarding the end time events. The end time events. So before jumping into chapter 25, join me in an examination of the end time events uh, that were spoken by Jesus himself. So we're going to back up into 24, Matthew 24. Well, in Matthew 24, everything begins with a question. Uh, the disciples were with Jesus, and they were walking past the Temple Mount, and at that time on the Temple Mount was the wonderful temple, the Jewish temple. And the disciples made comment that Jesus, to Jesus, saying, you know, this this temple is just magnificent. It is wonderful. And then Jesus took the opportunity to say to his disciples, what you see now will be destroyed. What you see, this beautiful temple is going to be destroyed. And it happened in AD 70 when Rome came in and occupied and conquered Israel at that time, and they destroyed the temple. And then in that question, uh, 
he, he, they, the disciples said this, and this is the question in verse 3. Look at it. It's on the screen for you. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. And they said, tell us, they said, when will this happen? In other words, when will this take place, the destruction of the temple? And then they added, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So that is the question that the disciples presented to Jesus. And then, of course, Jesus, he responded and answered their question. And it's interesting, that very same question that the disciples asked, you know, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? That question is also a question that we often ask as well, okay? Well, tomorrow, tomorrow is April 8th, and, uh, and it's become a very anticipated day, April 8th, tomorrow. And the reason that's been anticipated is because of this. There's going to be a major solar eclipse. Are you guys with me? Have you been hearing about this? Uh, there are a few prophecy people, you know, that study prophecy, students. Uh, they believe that this solar eclipse could be a sign of Jesus' return. And so Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rapture his church and take us away. And they're basing that on because of this solar eclipse. And there's more to it than that. But all I'm just wanting to say with to say to you is that, you know, there is a um, there is a desire present today among people wanting to know, okay, what is the sign? What is the sign, Jesus, of your second coming? And so that question is being asked to this present day. Well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna press into Matthew 24 here. And uh, in Matthew 24, as well as 25, Jesus answers the question, again, what are the signs, you know, what is the sign of your second coming, and what are, what's the end of the age looking like? So Jesus answers that question. He does so in Matthew 24 and 25, and what we're going to do at this time, if you have a sheet of paper with you with some of the notes, there's a timeline on that sheet that talks about uh, how the events of time are going to proceed okay, based on the biblical evidence. And so I want you to take a look at that timeline. We're going to have it also up here on the screen. So if you just take a look at that. Um, so if you're looking at Matthew, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to take Matthew 24 and 25, and we're going to impose those chapters, those verses on this timeline. And so your assignment is to maybe uh, for notes that you can take, you could probably jot down like, okay, Matthew 24, verses, uh, you know, 4 through 8 fall in this area, and you can probably put an arrow, write it and stuff. So that's just an encouragement what you could do, okay? So this is our timeline, and this is what Jesus is going to be talking about in Matthew 24 and 25. And as I said, I think we're in 25 today, but I believe we need to back up and review 24, Matthew 24, so we can once again get a good picture of what Jesus is saying. So um, where are we at right now? You'll see present church age. That's where we're at right now, okay, as a church. So as you sit here in this particular sanctuary, uh, you need to find yourself in the present age. Now the question is, how close are we as a church? How close are we to that big line there that's going up and down, that vertical line? And you'll see underneath it says rapture of the church. All right, are you with me on this? The question is, how close are we to that line, to the rapture of the church? In other words, how close are we to that event when Jesus Christ will take the church, which is you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, have accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you're part of the church, and you will be taken out of this world. And so our question is, how close are we to that? All right, and that's the basic question that the disciples are asking. Okay, what is the sign? Okay. Uh, how close are we to the end is basically what they were saying. So if you will look now at Matthew 24, uh, here's where Jesus, so Jesus is answering that question. So he's answering his disciples. Here's where we're at. And here are some verses. We're looking at verses tw 4 through 8 of Matthew 24. And uh, I believe Matthew 24, 4 through 8, is describing the church, okay, where the church is at this time. So follow along here. It says, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, 
For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Okay? So this is Jesus' uh, talk on the Mount of Olives, and he begins there in verse 4. And I think verses 4 through 8, if you want to take notes, occur in the present church age. So in our present age, where we're at right now, I believe verses 4 through 8 uh, fall in that category, the present church age. And, uh, and also, I might just kind of clarify, this is man's idea of how the Bible is going to unfold. So there's probably some flaws here, but uh, this is my attempt to understand verse, chapters 24 and 25. How does chapters 24 and 25 fall in place when it comes to the end time events? And so I'm saying to you that in my thought, uh, verses 4 through 8 take place in the church age. Now, let me ask you some questions here. Uh, it speaks there in verse 4, watch out that no one deceives you. Uh, are we living in a time of deception? Yeah, okay. Uh, Jesus says that there's going to be uh, uh, wars and there's going to be rumors of wars. Okay, your question is, have you heard of any wars lately? Okay, or even rumors of war? Have you heard anything about that? All right. Um, and it also goes on, Jesus says that there's going to be, in addition to wars, there's going to be famines, okay, and earthquakes. Let me ask you again, have you heard anything recently about earthquakes? Yeah, it wasn't just, uh, just last Saturday, Taiwan was hit by an earthquake that was like 7.2 on the Richter scale. And also... Somebody said there was an earthquake that happened in New York City just this week. Okay. Um, so also it talks about famines. I, was, I did a little quick research. It's estimated that uh, 30 to 40 million people are experiencing, they use the word food insecurity regarding famine. So that's what, 30 to 40 million people. So that's what's going on. So... It sounds like, again, you know, I've made the decision to put verses 4 through 8 here right in the present church age. That's where we're at, and it describes our time. And again, I always remember to keep in, the big question is, okay, how close are we to the rapture of the church? Um, and also there's a key verse there in that section of verses, verse 8. All these are the beginning of birth pains, okay, or the beginning of sorrows, as the King James says. All these are the beginning of birth pains. And they, they, it's, and if you take birth pains as the analogy, what takes, when you're going to have children, ladies know this very well, you start off with just some cramping, some whatever taking place, right? Contractions, contractions. Then as the baby gets closer and closer, those traction, contractions escalate in, you know, seriousness and frequency. So, anyhow, the question is how close we're to the rapture. All right, thanks, Dave. We'll go back to our, our uh, can we go back to the uh, timeline once again? So, we're in the present age. How close are is the rapture of the church? That's the next prophetic event to take place on this timeline. And we don't know when this is going to take place. Jesus said about three times in Matthew 24 and 25 that we do not know the time when God says, okay, this is it. It's time to kick in the uh, tribulation program. We don't know, okay? But we do know that God is going to take the church out of this, and that is based on 1 Thessalonians 4, and so I'll read that passage for you. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And uh, that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and it's talking about the rapture. Uh, before we kick into the years of tribulation, as you see there on the diagram, the rapture of the church will take place. 
and uh, we're not sure what, when that's going to take place, but uh, that's the next event regarding biblical prophecy and the timeline. Uh, and it's at this time, when the rapture of the church takes place, uh, the believer, those who believe in Jesus Christ, they're going to be gone. They're snatched out of here. All right? That's the good news. Um, then the tribulation will take place after the rapture. And uh, the tribulation is for the unbelieving Jewish people as well as the uh, unbelieving Gentiles. So those who have rejected Jesus Christ, saying, oh, that's hogwash, this whole idea of a Savior, uh, this whole idea that God is going to come back and take his people to be with him, that's a bunch of baloney. Those people are going to be surprised greatly, and they will be entering into the years of tribulation. That is after the rapture. Okay, So just understand, you as a believer will be gone, so these next... Uh, sections that we're talking about, understand they're not going to be too good, not too cheery to talk about, but understand because of your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have been removed from the world. And then God says, okay, now it's time to kick in the program that's going to deal with my rebellious people, Israel, as well as the Gentile nations that are rebelling against me. So now we come to the beginning of sorrows. It says there, it's going to be three and a half years long. And uh, this particular uh, section, I believe verses uh, 9 through 14, will fit in the beginning of sorrow. So again, Matthew 24, 9 through 14, those verses you can place in the section there of the beginning of sorrows. Here, here's the verses. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all the nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, and the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. All right? So again, Matthew... 24 verses 9 through 14, I believe, is describing the beginning of sorrows, okay? The first three and a half years of the tribulation. Okay? Well, let's just press on. I think because of time, we'll press right on here. Um, then we move to this section. It's uh, the desecration of the temple. And, uh, and also, in addition to the desecration of the temple, that section, we have the Great Tribulation. And so I believe in Matthew 24, uh, verses 15 through 25, those verses of Matthew 24, again, verses 15 through 25, are describing that last three and a half year um, period, okay? The Great Tribulation, they call it. So I'll read those verses for you, and you can listen to how Jesus speaks about the great tribulation. And we begin, first of all, um, Dave, could we back up to that uh, uh, picture once again, the timeline? Kind of make me jump around. Uh, as we begin reading right away, you're going to hear about uh, the abomination that causes desolation. Well, that's the desecration of the temple, okay? And uh, when, that take, when that takes place, that is a sh sure sign that we are now going into the Great Tribulation. So the Antichrist, so what it is, it's the Antichrist who is trying to rule the world at that time. He's going to make a covenant with the Jewish people and say, okay, hey, Jews, um, let's... Well, in fact, he makes the covenant way back uh, in the beginning of the sorrows. He makes the covenant there, saying the Jews can operate, they can have their temple worship, they can offer sacrifices, they can do their Jewish stuff that they want to, and so they do for three and a half years. They're at the beginning of the tribulation. And then the Antichrist says that's enough. Uh, and then he sets himself up as the one to be worshipped, which is the desecration of the temple. And then they press into the great tribulation. Well, let's read about it in Matthew 24, verses 15 through 28. So, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation... 
spoken of through the prophet Daniel. Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So that, again, was Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 uh, through 25. And I believe that section of verses, Scripture, would, is describing the Great Tribulation. And so what we see taking place in the years of this tribulation, the first three and a half years, um, it's not going to be rosy, okay? It's not going to be good. You don't really want to be there for that. But as far as intensity... It's not going to be as bad as the last three and a half years. It's really going to be intense. Okay, and again, uh, this is the Antichrist. He's trying to. He's going to be ruling at that time. And so, you know, is is this going to happen? Is this really going to happen? Well, of course, there's the naysayers and there's the people that think, ah, you know, I don't believe in this God stuff that He's going to come back, uh, and so forth. Well, what is interesting is as you listen to the verbiage of our culture and our world today, they are using verbiage and wording that fall, fall right in line with what God is predicting for the future. And now what we hear a lot about today is this whole idea of uh, the Great Reset. You've heard that one? The Great Reset, the, uh, the New World Order. All right, these are these words and phrases that are being coined through our culture. And what they are looking at, man's pursuit, is to have a one-world government. One-world government. Which means there's going to be a one-world ruler. That's just where things are going. And I think what's excited about that, for me, I don't want to be around for that for sure, but what's exciting is, again, it's just confirming Scripture. God has said these things, and man is bringing it to pass. It's pretty. So God is... His word is true. We can trust him. All right? Great. So the abomination of desolation, we saw that in verse 15 right away. That is the desecration of the temple. That's where the Antichrist, he is going to be the one world ruler. He's going to set himself up as God. It's time for everybody to worship me and look to me, is what he says. And he's going to break his covenant with Israel. And then it's going to be bad after that. And again, those passages says this, for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. And he says, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Okay, they'll be shortened. So how are those days going to be shortened, right? That's what he says, they're going to be shortened. Well, that brings us to the next event there at the end of the tribulation, which will be the return of Jesus Christ. He's going to come back, okay? Uh, that particular passage would be Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31. Again, if you're taking notes, you could uh, jot Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31 up there at the top, draw an arrow to the return of Christ. And here's the passage from Matthew. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Okay, so that is the second coming, describing the second coming of Jesus. And when Jesus comes back, the return of Christ, 
he comes back and he physically and visibly will be reigning as king at that time, and that is the millennium there. And that millennium is a thousand years. So that millennial reign of Christ, if you can jot in there, is going to be 1,000 years. And uh, the passage that speaks to that is Revelation chapter 20. Let me read that passage for you. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads and their hands. Okay, and this is describing those who, who survived the tribulation, okay? And, uh, or excuse me, they lost their lives in the tribulation. Excuse me, they lost their lives. They came to life. Those are the tribulation saints that lost their life because they were going to follow Jesus and not the Antichrist or the world. They came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, that's that millennium. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in this first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Again, there's that thousand years. That's that millennium. And uh, so, uh, yeah, those of us who've been raptured with the church, uh, Revelation indicates that uh, we will come back with Jesus at his return, his second coming, and uh, we will assist him in some form, some manner, in the, uh, I guess, the, the logistics, if you will, the, the governing at that time. We'll have ro roles where we'll work for the King of Kings, helping him during that time, during his millennial reign. All right. So now a question pops up. And this kind of question is what leads us into the passage that we're going to study. We're just going to go through it briefly so you won't be here forever, okay? But uh, so uh, who's going to be in the millennial reign of Christ, the millennial kingdom, that thousand years? Who's, what's the population? Who's populating that time? Uh, during that time, there's going to be what we call the resurrected saints, and I just briefly talked about that, how we, though we were raptured there by God, and we bypass the tribulation when Jesus returns for the second time, that which is the second coming, Jesus' return, we as believers will come back with him and we will assist in his rule and his reign during the millennial kingdom. So the millennial kingdom will be pop populated by, uh, we'll, we'll play a role in there, so we'll be with our new bodies, resurrected bodies, I'm not sure how that works, but we'll be assisting Jesus at that time. But also people that go into the millennium, will be those individuals that are called the tribulation saints. So those individuals, uh, those people that were able to survive that seven-year period, okay, they made it through the first three and a half years, and somehow they made it through the last three and a half years, uh, meaning when they made it, they remained true and loyal to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ. They avoided taking the mark of the beast, all that stuff in Revelation. They avoided all that stuff. They were able to save themselves for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I'm sure it wasn't an easy time at all going through the tribulation, but somehow they made it through the tribulation period, and they will enter in to that millennium time, those who survived the tribulation. And that brings us to Matthew 25, and um, that was where we, we were going to pick up our series in. And so, again, we're not going to spend a lot of time there, but you'll see it talks about uh, those individuals that will populate the millennium. So look at Matthew 25 with me. And uh, we start in verse 31, and I'll read to the end of the chapter, but it's called the judgment of the sheep and goats. So I'll read through that, give you some explanation, and then we'll wrap it up. So here, Matthew 25 and uh, 31 to the end of the chapter. And remember, this is the Olivet Discourse. This is Jesus' message to his disciples. They asked the question, okay, what are the signs? What does it look like in the end times? And then Jesus went on to share verses 24 and 25. And so here we're at the end of the tribulation period. Jesus has returned, and this is where we pick up the story. 
When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When when did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Well, the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So again, we're on the the, uh, Olivet Discourse, it's Matthew 25, and that was the last verses of Matthew 25, where it is, uh, and it's called the a judgment of the sheep and goats. And so our question is, okay, where does this section of verses fall when it comes to our timeline? Well, it comes, the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25 there, uh, verses 31 to the end, they would fall right there, right after the return of Christ, okay? Right after his return. And uh, so, and the question is, who occupies the millennium there, that thousand-year period? Well, it's going to be the sheep, and not the goats. And so the sheep and goat judgment there, which takes place right after Jesus returns, what it is, it's a judgment of those who survive the great tribulation, okay, that tribulation. They have gone through that seven years. Jesus is now returned, and he is establishing his millennial rule of a thousand years, and he is going to allow certain people to enter into his millennium. And from our story here in Scripture, it's going to be the sheep. He refers to them to the sheep. Those are on his right hand. And they are the ones who remain true and loyal to Jesus Christ through the tribulation. And you know that they were loyal and true to Jesus Christ but you see, because you see, even though things were rough and terrible, they still expressed kindness and goodness to the people of God at that time, whether they're Jew or Gentile. Okay, So... They were totally commit, committed to Christ, willing to lose their life for him, but they survived. And so those are the ones who come in to the millennium. Then we have the goats. Remember, this is the judgment of the sheep and goats. The goats are those who survive the tribulation, but they don't give a hoot about the Messiah, about God. They don't give a hoot about the people who were struggling so in the tribulation period. They were just looking out for number one, me, myself, and I. That's who they were, okay? Probably probably rich people, you know? I'm, I'm thinking of people like, uh, you know, who have are billionaires, okay, who were able to build their bunkers on the Hawaiian islands and get away for a while and had the food and water and all that stuff to protect themselves as they went through the tribulation period. And as it was done, you know, they just focused on themselves, and there was many people that could have used their help, but they didn't give a hoot. They didn't give a care. They were just looking out for number one. 
And Jesus recognizes that during that judgment and says, you know, you weren't concerned about me. You weren't concerned about my people, those who were struggling so in the tribulation. Uh, basically, that is a sign of rejection. Therefore, you depart from me. And when they departed, they went to their place of destruction. Place of destruction. All righty. That's where we're going to stop. That's where I think Matthew chapter 24 fits in, right here. And I felt this morning we needed to back up and kind of see that. And here's some reasons, let me, uh, as we conclude. Uh, Why study this end time events? Why study them? Well, it plays a part in your worldview. Uh, at this stage of our life, in, in, the, in the stage of our world, things are kind of crazy. Wouldn't you say that? Things are just not making sense. Well, on a human level, they don't make sense. But when you can take the events of the day and filter them through what God has said in His Word, okay, you you begin to make sense of the things. And that is a biblical worldview, and that's what I want you to have. Because a biblical worldview is what helps us remain sane in this crazy world, but is also this biblical worldview that gives us hope when we see crazy things taking place and we see injustice, all right? And we see the love of people growing cold and we see lawlessness escalating and we see... um, deception being ramped up. Do we like it? No. But since we can put it through our biblical worldview, like we've seen with this chart, we know that's what is going to take place in the end. We know that it's coming. All right? So we're formulating a biblical worldview, and uh, your assignment is as you encounter life in general, things that don't make sense, go back to the Word of God. Let God be your filter as you look these events and craziness as you look through those things. So why do we look at the end time events? It plays a part in our worldview. Here's a second reason why it's okay to look at end time events or prophecy, because God himself has said in Revelation chapter 1, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. That's what uh, was written in Revelation chapter 1. So understanding end-time events and prophecy, you know, you may not master it. That's okay. But here's what I want you to take away this morning. There is a blessing. God says there is a blessing for you in knowing what's going on in this world. Okay? There is a blessing for you. And I'm not sure how God is going to bless you. It might be just, hey, I don't have the fear like the other people have or whatever it may be. That might be your blessing. I don't know. But there is a blessing in knowing what prophecy is about. So that was number two. Here's a third thing. Why I study the end time events? To remind us of the urgency of, um, of, the, of, the, of this age, I guess, of this stage of life. Remind us of the urgency um, of this age. So remember when, I was, when we started off, we're in the present church age. That's where we're at. And we looked at Matthew chapter 24, verses like 3 through 8. But the question is, okay, how close are we to that vertical line called the rapture of the church? I was thinking about that. Look look at an hourglass, you know, the taper of the hourglass and the sand, you know. If the sand's up at the top, it seems like there's a lot of time. But maybe the sand is way down here. So there's not a whole lot of sand left in the hourglass, you know. So it's urgent. It's kind of urgent. So that means... You know, we need to be talking about Jesus Christ. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to miss out. And uh, so we want to tell people that they need Jesus. We want to avoid the tribulation time. Remember, Jesus says it's it's unequaled as far as the the destruction and the what's going on. It's unequaled in in history. There's never been anything like it. So. We'd like to see some people find Jesus and avoid all that. So there's an urgency. And then lastly, here's the fourth thing. Uh, Why study end time events? To remind us once again, we are on the winning team. Okay, Winning team. 
You know, I, I don't like what's going on in our world, okay? It just seems like uh, the government wants to get their, their foot in, in the door of my life more and more, okay? They want me to, uh, you know, the, you've probably heard about digital currency, the CBDC, digital bank currency and stuff, uh, so they can track you. You can't rip them off <laughs> for whatever the reason they want. They don't want you, they want you to pay your taxes and all that stuff. And if you don't do what they say, the word is they can, you know, take away some of your credit. And I mean, I don't want that kind of crud in my life, right? But I'm going to survive because I know, you know, there's going to be some rottenness taking place. But in the end, well, number one, I'm going to be taken out of here, and uh, that's my 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 conviction. Remember, this is man's best attempt to put together what God has said. Okay, well, I, I think we'll as a church are going to be taken out of here. We're going to avoid the seven years, and we'll come back with him. Um, but knowing that is what gives me sanity, I guess, if you will, puts joy in my heart. Maybe I should say because I know. He who is the victor, and that's Jesus, right? He's coming back. He's going to get, get us all. But that's so, I, so we see crazy things in this world. We see what's being pushed. We, we, the confusion, you know, man wanting to be a girl, girl wanting to be a guy, you know. I mean, just doesn't make sense. Well, I maybe don't need to understand it all. What I do need to know is, in the end, my Jesus wins, and I'm on his team. Therefore, I win. You're a winner. You're a winner. Let's pray. Lord, thanks again for the, uh, you know, just to be able to talk about your word here. We looked at your Olivet Discourse here that you gave to your disciples on the Mount of Olives, and they had the question, Lord, they were wondering, you know, what does it look like? You know, when will all these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? That's what they're asking. And Lord, that's the same question that we ask ourselves. And uh, Lord, we're able to kind of get a picture here, what things look like through your word. Um, it may not make sense, and it may be kind of scary, but I guess, I guess where we land, Lord, this morning, when it's all said and done, is we, we land on that truth. Uh, you're the winner. You're the victor. And because we belong to you, we too are victorious. Thank you for that truth, Lord. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name.